Honored to be here. I really mean that. It's good to see Ben and Tish and, and Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me. He's the one who was really the catalyst. Said you got to go to this church. Revival's breaking down this church, Kingdom Movement Church. I'd never heard of you guys, and uh, because you know I would go to Bethesda when I come in this area, but uh, but I am so glad because I feel because I, I heard that sixty five percent of you are from Russian background, Slavic background. And I feel what God is doing is that he's raising up people of different ethnic backgrounds to bring about a, a great revival. I'm talking about the Latino community. I think it was just uh, uh, my good friend, um, Sammy Rodriguez, for example, in Northern California. God's really raised him up uh, in a very significant way in California. He's on the board of the, one of the ministries I oversee. And so, but it's, it's just something that he's doing. And that's why I said, uh, that God's raising up the ladies in this house. So I like to have all the women stand up right now. You are armed and dangerous. I want to pray for you especially because God is going to prophesy through, yes, his sons, but his sons and daughters will prophesy. Can I hear an amen from the ladies? Okay. <laughs> and so, Father, I thank you so much for really the daughters that you love so much, you have chosen, you have anointed, You've lavished them with your kindness and grace, and you've called them to be Esthers, that they are born for such a time as this. And Lord, I believe to save a nation. And Lord, I thank you that even the mama bears are rising up, you know. They're saying enough is enough of transgenderism being shoved down four or five year olds in our school system, critical race theory. And Lord, even. Uh, in San Francisco, 70% of the women came out and voted to remove three school board members because they're tired and fed up with the way their children are being abused. And so, Lord, I just thank you so much for empowering the moms here, the ladies, the moms-to-be. And, Lord, I pray for a special impartation of increase of spiritual authority and more of your power and more intimacy and knowledge of you in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. And everyone said amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I want you to lay hands on me afterwards. Not all of you, but you know, <laughs> I need to receive an impartation from you. I really feel that. I feel that God's right. I have three daughters, and they scare me. <laughs> They're absolutely amazing, you know. And my family, for those who don't know, I, I'm Korean, but my wife is Filipina. Born in New York City, though. And um, her parents uh, are medical doctors, and my mother-in-law is still, um, she's a retired pediatrician, but she's still going strong at the age of 97. And so she's uh, in San Diego. And I'll tell you how prophetic she is. She's with the first one to get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit among her family members. They're all Roman Catholic. And, and after Sue, her mom got saved. And, but in December of um, 2019, uh, she was in this high-end retirement center in San Diego. And she could afford it because she uh, was well-to-do as a medical doctor. Her husband was an anesthesiologist. And so she had this uh, retirement center where they had big bands come out once a month. And the food was just exceptional. So it wasn't, you know, they had medical doctors on staff. But she said, I feel I need to move into my own uh, apartment. And she explained that uh, Sue's sister, Michelle, was coming up from Hawaii. She lived in Hawaii, but she was moving back to San Diego to take care of her. And she said, I don't want to, I, I want to be more independent. And we're just saying, Mom, you know, you're in your 90s, mid-90s, and, you know, it, it's just a burden for us, you know, to make sure that you're okay. And if you're by yourself, you know, we're, we're, we're really, really busy. And for us to have to come down from L.A. just to take care of her. She said, no, trust me, uh, Michelle will take care of me, and so, and so I'm good. And so uh, we said, okay, you know, she's very independent, very, very strong, a real uh, leader uh, in her industry, of course, as a doctor, as a Filipino to be educated here in the United States and raise herself as a doctor in the 50s as a, as a minority, as an Asian American was just extraordinary. Anyway, so she moves out and then 2020 hits and COVID hits the retirement center. All these people were seniors die and by God's grace, God spoke to her to leave that atmosphere just in time. Thank God for the voice of God, amen? I mean, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 20, uh, 31, where it says, I'm gonna whisper behind you. This is the way walking in it. 
And so this is the, one of the greatest gifts that God's given to us, his voice. And that's why the first manifestation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that your sons and daughters will prophesy. In other words, you'll hear from God and then you'll speak what God tells you to do. And so what we want to do tonight is really host the Holy Spirit and I want to pray for you, but I want to really do some listening prayers. I pray for you. I'm going to do my best to get some words of knowledge for healing, but it's your responsibility to not just say, well, who doesn't have a headache? You know, that's just for someone else. No, you need to claim if there's a word coming for you, it's your responsibility to move in faith. And I want to talk about that in a moment. But I've been really um, meditating on um, Romans 8 where Paul says the anxious longing of creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The whole creation is groaning for us to come forth as sons of God. And that's been haunting me because... Really, we are here partnering with God. God's the healer, but we're partnering with him, and he's trusting you to be like him here on earth. 1 John 4, 17, the second part of that verse says, as he is, so are we in the world. As he is, you're to be like Jesus wherever you go. Heal the sick, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. And yet, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't know who we are. The main thing that is hindering us from coming into our destiny is this right here. The biggest blessing, but also enemy. And, and so as a man thinks within himself, so he is, it says in Proverbs. And that's why Paul prays, and you know this prayer, and I want to pray this over you. He bows his knee and says, I pray that the Heavenly Father will give you a spirit of wisdom, and revelation in the knowledge of him. First of all, that you would know him. Yeah. Come into that union, intimacy. That knowing there is, is, is almost like a physical oneness. That the eyes of your heart will be enlightened that you will know the hope of your calling to. That you would know who your calling is. That you're a son of God. And that the riches of his inheritance will be made known to you. What, what does that mean to be a son and to know that you have an inheritance? See, in the Asian culture, the firstborn, and I'm Asian, got the inheritance and was his responsibility to pass it around. And so that's why when the Bible talks about sons of God, it means sons of God. It doesn't say sons and daughters. Now, don't get mixed up and messed up with the gender thing because we're also the bride of Christ. And I accept that as a bride of Christ, as a man. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But your son is intentional. Turn with me to Galatians 4.4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem us from the law. And here's why it says, this, this has to come by revelation because this is also said in, in um, Romans 8. But Paul says it differently in Galatians 4. And so, 4.4, 4, God sent under law so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Please underscore that. You've been adopted. Now listen, if we just had forgiveness of sins, if Jesus just died for us, and we're forgiven, and we have eternal life, we would all be so eternally grateful. Can I hear an amen? amen. I mean, really, I, I shared my testimony, how I was a drug addict, and he delivered me from dominion of darkness into his marvelous light in one day at a Deep Purple concert. <laughs> I walked out of the Baltimore Civic Center, I was instantly delivered from drug addiction, and that's the last time I did drugs, before the Lord. Been 49 years of being drug free. And God gets all the glory because it's by grace you're saved through faith, not that of yourself. It's a gift of God. And of course, it was there under Jesus people movement where all these people got radically saved. I had a friend who was a hell's angel, biker, murdered man in Los Angeles, was sent to prison, but he gets radically saved and he gets delivered from heroin. He was a heroin junkie before, he, and, and when he got saved, he had to go to prison. And he was in prison, but... Uh, and wasn't for murder, by the way, for another charge. Uh, he murdered in L.A., but he was in prison in Maryland 
for some other offenses. But he was on probation. I took him into my house because uh, I lived in a home that a number of brothers were renting. And, um, and I discipled him. He became a pastor. He became a prophet in my life. You know, this guy was a hell's angel biker with tattoos all over. I mean, he was scary looking, you know. I mean, muscles upon muscles. I mean, they were just... And yet he got radically saved by the grace of God. And so that's what God... So if we just had that, we would be forever grateful. But God says, not only that, but I'm going to make you my sons. I'm adopting you. I'm adopting you into my family. And of course, it means the same equivalent as being born into the family in the Asian culture. Because with that comes your inheritance. So that's why Paul goes on to say, and uh, he says here, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts where we cry out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, no longer a slave to sin, no longer in bondage to the things of this world. You've died to sin. And Paul says earlier in in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. You need to receive that. He loves you with an everlasting love and gave himself up for me. And so I'm just so blown away by his mercy that he would forgive me. But then he says, I'm adopting you as my son. And then he says, this is so beautiful. And I want you to see that a son, then an heir through God. A son and then heir through God. By the way, this is not my Bible, so I had to borrow it, so I'm sort of trying to find my place here. You know, my Bible I left at home, and so I had to get another Bible here, but, but so bear with me. A lot of times, that's why I just quote it because I can't find it in a new Bible. You know how it is with your Bible. You just know the place where it is, but with, with a new Bible, it's just it's a little bit uh, disoriented. But here's the thing. We're an heir. What does that mean? Remember Herodias stands before Herod and Tippus? And uh, he was so pleased with it. He said, I'll give you anything you ask for up to half the kingdom. And he meant that. He's from, you know, he's saying this in front of his royal staff, dignitaries, and he had to be good on that word. And so she asked her mom and said, ask for John the Baptist on a platter, his head on the platter. So she asked for that, and he was grieved because he didn't want to execute John the Baptist. He knew he was a prophet from God, but he had to do it. And he was willing to give up half the kingdom, but I want to give you a word that will change your life. Luke 12, 32 is the Father's good pleasure to give you the whole kingdom. That's your inheritance. He's not holding back. He's not just giving you a piece or a partial or just an acreage or whatever the, the way that you would measure the kingdom because the kingdom is not metaphysical. It's not meat or drink. Yeah. Romans 14, 17. But it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I tell you, some of you look like you could use joy. You look like... <laughs> You're wearing tight underwear. You don't look too happy out there. I see some people out there just. <laughs> Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Being right with God. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're right with God. What a powerful statement because the foundation of his own is righteousness and justice. And he says, you're right with me. You're fulfilling my purpose is the, the word I gave to Abraham, going back to Genesis, I believe, 18, that he should teach his household righteousness and justice. You're now walking that out because of what Jesus did for us, not because of our works. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become righteous. It's a supernatural transformation. His spirit comes inside you and changes you from within. And all of a sudden, you want to love him, follow him. It's all grace. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, I'm giving you the kingdom because with that comes supernatural peace. One thing I, I love about Bill Johnson, I just came back from the memorial service. I was there and uh, it was just uh, very, very moving. It was like almost four hours of weeping and laughing and weeping. They would tell funny stories about Benny and Will, 
laugh and then all of a sudden they'll say something and all of a sudden you're weeping. And uh, I mean, there are Kleenexes everywhere. Everyone had to have a box of Kleenex to themselves. It was just a tearjerker type of moment. But Bill was just at this incredible peace and calm. And I've asked him about this. I said, Bill, you know, you know because we, we spent a couple of days afterwards just hanging out just to encourage him and we're having meals at his house and all that. But he said this, he said, I never allow anyone or anything rob me of my peace. Wow, I said, man, I love that. Don't let anyone rob you of a peace because it's a supernatural peace. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. My peace I give it to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. In the midst of all the shaking, in the midst of the storm, we need that supernatural peace. That passes all comprehension. doesn't even make sense. This is what Philippians 4, 6 says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. And the peace that passes all comprehension will guard your heart and your mind. This is where the battle takes place. In Christ Jesus. And, and so he's giving you all the kingdom. But here's what specifically I want to focus in on. What he's given you is his authority and his power. And for us to move in the signs and wonders that he's expecting us in this move of the Holy Spirit, you have to have a revelation of who you are in Christ and the authority you have in Christ Jesus. When Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, you know this passage is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. What he's implying is that the authority that I took back from the enemy that we lost in the garden, because God had given man dominion. He gave him authority. In fact, he said, and for those who don't feel that we should be involved in government, right there in Genesis 1, 28, he says, subdue evil. That Hebrew word kabas is there. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Then he says something really strange. He says, subdue the enemy. Now, who's the enemy in the garden? It's Adam and Eve. It's just two of them. And they're looking at each other. Who's the enemy? How many of you know your spouse is not the enemy? Come on. <laughs> the enemy is the enemy. Satan was already cast down. Here's the thing that's so amazing. God expected us to finish up what he began. Again, we're called to partner with him. So he throws him out of, out of heaven, and now he's on the earth. He took one third of the demons with him, and he's there. And God expected us to finish the job. But unfortunately, and the way the enemy got in there is just a questioning his identity. Did God say... Did he really say who you are? And all of a sudden that doubt comes in, the question, and that playbook is still so true in the body of Christ today. I travel around, I minister to the church primarily because I'm here to bring about revival. Revival begins with the church first, always begins with the church. It's to awaken the church. It's to call the church to her first love. And especially pastors, that's why I do a pastor's meeting wherever I go. And so my MO has been during this revival tour is to meet with pastors on Saturday and like we did yesterday and then to meet with the church on, on Sunday. But it's really uh, amazing to see how passive the church is because they simply don't know. Again, destroy for lack of knowledge. And so God says, listen, I want to give you my kingdom. I'm waiting for you to come forth as my sons. And the whole creation is groaning. It's almost like the world, even the physical, natural world is waiting for us to come forth because we're the answer to the problems of environment. We're the answer to the problems of every single problem in society and on the earth. The church. As the church goes, so goes the rest of the world. I mean, you guys are looking at me like, you know, what the heck are you talking about? But I'm telling you, this is the word of God. And that's why I'm praying what Paul prayed. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Not only the knowledge of him, but who you are in Christ. Because the two things the devil will do, he'll distort the image and nature of God, but he'll also distort who you are in Christ. He will keep you from knowing who you are. That you are son of God and you have authority. And so here's what he says. 
he says that, you know, we, we talked about by grace we have been saved through faith. Not that every soul is a gift of God. But not only that, but it says here that he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. So what we have to understand is that where we get stuck is that we just take the gospel in a partial way. We think our sins are forgiven. That's it. We have eternal life. We have to be united with him, not only in the death, but also the resurrection, his ascension, and his uh, place at the right hand of the Father. We are seated now with him in heavenly places. That's your home. I know we're here on earth, but the reality is that God wants us to live like heaven on earth. And that's why Bill's book, Heaven Invading Earth, was such a, a revolutionary, catalytic book. So when Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, this is a great verse to claim. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every, say every. every. That means everything. Again, he's given you the kingdom. But it's in the heavenly places. But that's where you live, is in the heavenly places. That's why Paul says, don't set your affections on things on earth. Set your affection on things above where Christ is but we're hidden with Christ in God. Now, what will help you to understand that you're with him in the heavenly places and you have authority, I want to just go on one verse, Colossians 1, 27, and that is Christ in you, the hope of glory, because Christ is inside you. We're talking about God himself is inside you. And to make it real clear in Colossians 1, I believe 19 and Colossians 2, 19, it says that it was God's good pleasure for the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to be in Jesus. Now think about that. The fullness of the triune being is in Jesus and Jesus is inside you, Christ in you, Chris. You are carrier of the glory of God. That's why you're blowing things up wherever you go, because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Are you getting this? Tell the person next to you, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Come on. I want you to just really get the revelation of this. That's why I said to the ladies, you are armed and dangerous, but the reality is every single believer, the newest believer is armed and dangerous because you're Jesus here on earth representing him. Again, as he was in the world, so are we now. It blows me away because I said, God, you're so good. I mean, I would just, again, if I just went to heaven, eternal life, my sins forgiven, being delivered, that's that's wonderful. But he says, no, I have a divine assignment. What was lost in the garden, I've now restored. I'm giving you authority. That's why the Bible says he made us a little Lord himself and crowned us with glory and majesty. Psalm 8. Put all things under our feet made us to rule over the earth. You're to rule. You're seated with him to rule. It's a royal place. You're seated on the throne. You know, I tell you, this revelation came home to me because in 2004, we bought a $38 million building. It's a performance arts building. If you just Google Ambassador Auditorium, you'll get a virtual tour of it. It is the most ostentatious building. We didn't build it, but it was built by a cult leader, Herbert Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God. Literally, the ceiling is covered with 24 karat, not 18 karat, or 20, 24 karat gold leaf. The whole wall is pure onyx, which is the gemstone. Made, uh, I mean, they collected all the onyx in North America, Latin America to put in this building. We have the largest amount of uh, onyx anywhere in America or Latin America. It's crazy. The carpet is handmade wool from India. It's purple, by the way. Deep purple. Yeah, I was just saying. Deep color purple. It really is. It's beautiful. The chandelier is over a million dollars. Just a chandelier in the lobby. It's not my DNA. We were at Mata Auditorium holding nightly meetings, you know, in a barn that was built in 1948 after World War II. That was just, you know, I mean, it smelled, it stunk. We did everything to clean it up. It was just... People brought their dogs in and, you know, to, to attend the service. And we didn't care because it, there was no carpet. There was nothing to mess up in that place. But the glory came. And we had nightly meetings from 1995 to 1998, five nights a week. Like Toronto, it was amazing. 
we hosted the Holy Spirit. There were angelic visitation. I remember my daughter, my two daughters, the two youngest, uh, they, they had um, uh, this incredible visitation in 1995, May 26. I will never forget this. And they walked into the auditorium and they prophesied because they were just praying all night. This is a Saturday night. I'm trying to get to bed because the next day is uh, the service, Sunday morning service, and we had service there as well. But there were problems on, we have to go to Mott. And so Sue, my wife, who's very, she's like a prophet in my life, she's picking up something that's going on with these girls. And I wrote about this when, uh, on, on a book on glory, uh, uh, when heaven came down. And what happened was, is that she had the key to my auditorium, she went into my auditorium, and my wife said, the moment the door opened up, they saw angels everywhere, thousands of doves on rafters. And we're not talking about little cherubs and pampers. We're talking about warring angels, 15 foot. We have a high ceiling. And, and, and so they immediately went and got Lou Engel, who was living across the street because he was overseeing the prayer house. Lou couldn't see a thing. It was just the kids and my daughter. And, and uh, my wife. And so Lou was so incredulous, he had his micro cassette recorder and he separated the daughters and, and just said, okay, describe what you're seeing. And they were describing it to a T. And he freaked out. <laughs> By the way, if you see a 15 foot angel, you're going to need Pampers yourself. And so. lasted for like six months and then lifted. And by the way, during that time, you would walk into the auditorium, gold dust would just be everywhere. Wow. You know, it's like someone was playing with glitter go for Sunday school, but it wasn't. It was just what come upon. Perfume, this scent, this heavenly scent came into our, I mean, this place stunk, but this scent came in every night. Wow. See, I believe we're going to see that and much more. Yeah. It's a Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm not holding anything back. And so he's given us this amazing authority, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's why he says in Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority to trade upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you, nothing. You don't have to be afraid the enemy's defeated. And so when Jesus died on the cross, we have to understand that he did something that was just amazing. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 15, he just armed the principalities and powers and made a public display of them. And when he rose again, it says in Revelation 1, he holds the keys, which represents authority to death and hell. And that's why he says prophetically in Matthew 16, 18, now you've got to realize that he takes them to Caesarea Philippi. How many of you have never been to Israel? Let me just get a pulse here. You know, okay. Listen, I lead a tour, a Bible tour, a revival tour to Israel. I've done it for 12 years, except when the COVID hit and then we, we haven't gone back. We tried to go last year, but again, they locked down right before. We had like 40 people ready to go. And that was amazing because it was still, everyone was afraid of, and they had to get vaccinated to go. And so no one <laughs> showed up, but around 40. But uh, I, I'm going to go again in 2023. So just check out our website, Harvest International Ministry. I'd love to lead you in this tour. Save up your money. It will change your life. Because where Caesarea Philippi is, there's two Caesarea, one by the sea. And that's where Pontius Pilate lived. And that's the governmental sea. It wasn't Jerusalem. That's where the governor lived. And so it's like a mini Rome. I mean, you have a Hippodome there. You have a Colosseum, just like Rome. And that's what an apostle does. He transformed the culture to make it look like Rome so that the Roman emperor would feel at home. And so he says, I'm calling you to be apostles. I want you to bring heaven's culture, my kingdom culture to earth and transform it so that when I show up, when I come back in Revelation 21, when he comes and creates a new heaven, a new earth, he says, already half the job is done because you've done a good job. It's amazing. And so... So in Caesarea Philippi, you go to, uh, it's like a three-hour drive, three days walking distance from Galilee all the way north near Mount Hermon, and it's lush there. Every place is like a desert or semi-arid desert, but when you go up to Caesarea Philippi, that's where the rain comes. That's why the Bible says uh, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. 
It's like the oil coming on Aaron's head, but it says it's like the rain coming upon Mount Hermon to the mountains of Zion. That's where God commands the blessing, life forevermore, right? Psalm 133. And so that is a beautiful psalm, but it talks about the rain, which is a metaphor for revival. That's why in Zechariah 10, 1, it says, ask for rain in the latter rain. When it starts raining, and by the way, it's raining here. It is raining here. It is not just here, it's with you guys. It's raining in this part of the country. You gotta ask for more. That's the time to really pray. That's when to strike when the iron's hot. And so, and so, uh, so you go up there and it's beautiful, it's green and uh, the Jordan River starts there. But there is a huge cave and it's called the gate of hell. Inside the cave, there's a natural stone. And what the pagans did, they offered sacrifices on that stone. That's why it's called the gate of hell. Human sacrifices. The Moabites, I mean, listen, killing innocent children, the hands that shed innocent blood is nothing new. The devil has always gone after children because he knows the next generation could be the generation that ushers in the greatest revival. And so we see that obviously with Herod killing all those in, in Bethlehem. Of course, uh, Moses' generation almost got exterminated by Pharaoh. And so the devil is after the youngest. And that's why abortion is the number one injustice issue of our time. And even though Roe's been overturned, hear me, our real fight begins. Because abortion is still legal in Washington, in Oregon, in California. California is the number one abortion state. And we have to roll up our sleeves and work. And we got to vote biblically. We got to vote pro-life candidates into office because elections do have consequences. Just what Trump did by nominating three justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett has overturned Ray, but that's just part of it. Now we have to continue to go after life. Again, that's what the kingdom is all about. And so anyway, forgive me for going off on this rabbit trail, but it's really <laughs> necessary. But, but the thing is, is that he says, who do men say that I am in this place? Of all the places, he takes them all the way up to the, and, and they said, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. And he looks at Peter, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replies, Peter, you're not that brilliant. <laughs> Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to him, but my father gave you this revelation. And then he says, you are Peter. And in the Greek, it's the word Petra, a small stone. And, but on this rock, this rock of Gibraltar, I will build my ecclesia, you. And no matter how evil it gets with child sacrifice, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We win. Come on. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and we're going to reign forever and ever. We win. It's a done deal. So from this position of authority, he says, now I give you the keys of the kingdom. The keys, again, represent, this is verse 19 of Romans, I mean, uh, John, uh, Matthew um, uh, 16. 19, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. But here's the key, though. The way it reads in the Greek is that whatever you bind on earth must first be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose must first. In other words, heaven initiates. You don't just do whatever you want to do. I bind this and bind that and lose this, and we don't get that prayer. That's why prayer begins with God. God speaks to us, and we pray what he wants us to pray. And so we got it all backwards. And so we, that's why the prophetic, I love the prophetic. Anyone who wants to shut down prophetic, I said that is, that is one of the greatest gifts God's given to us. That's why prophets have to be honored. In the Old Testament was a prophet, then the priest, and then the king. Prophets appointed kings, like Saul was appointed by Samuel. And, and David, after Saul blew it, was appointed. And, and Nathan comes along and rebukes the King David when he sinned. But can I tell you what the hierarchy is? There is a hierarchy in God's kingdom. Even the angels, there, there's a hierarchy. In the New Testament, it's not prophets. It's first apostles, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, second prophets, third teachers. 
And that's why I wrote a book, Modern Day Apostles, to really encourage people to recognize who the apostles are in their midst and honor them. Because Vic, you, pro- you quoted from Matthew 10, 40, whoever receives a prophet, they, but it was really, the context was with his apostles, whoever receives you as apostles is receiving me. You're receiving Jesus when you receive an apostle. To honor apostle, to recognize apostles, to be aligned with apostles is all critical in this move of the Holy Spirit, the next move of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I've given you that kind of authority. When you hear from me, you bind it, it will be bound. When you hear from me and you lose, it will be loosed. And we've seen amazing, amazing miracles. I wish I had time to share. But the voice of God is so important. Why is that so important? Because I want to just cut to the chase. We know this verse, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the rhema of God, the prophetic word of God. Not just the logos. That's not how faith comes. And it takes faith to implement all this who are, we are in Christ Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You could say, I have the glory, I have the authority, I have the power, but if you don't move out in faith, you have nothing. Yeah, yeah. Faith without action is dead, it says in James 2, 17. You're just dead. And that's what we see. We just see the walking dead. It sounds like a movie that's coming out uh, with the church, with the ecclesia. Because, again, we just don't know, but the devil has kept us down. And that's why I'm here to to share the truth and love, because the truth will set you free. You should know the truth, and truth will set you free. And so we have to move in faith, and this is the key to even healing. I've been in the healing ministry since 1974. The first ministry I got involved with was healing. I was overseeing a Bible study with 2,000 kids meeting every Tuesday night during the Jesus People Movement. And every night, we gave, every Tuesday night, we gave an invitation for salvation, but for healing. And I oversaw the healing room. We would have 200, 300 people in the healing room, the overflow room. And I would pray for them. I would give a little teaching. And here's what I've learned over the years in healing. It takes faith for someone to get healed. Either your faith, like James Five says a prayer offered in faith. Verse 17 will heal the one who's sick. So you have to move in faith if you're going to pray. But most often we see the person who's sick have faith. Like the woman with the issue of blood. If I just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to get healed. I mean, she already had the faith. Because she had to be quarantined. With an issue of blood, you could not be uh, in public. You had to be quarantined. You had to be separate. Sounds like COVID. You have to isolate yourself or whatever days it is. And yet she just said, Jesus is coming. I'm not going to let this pass me by. She was so hungry, so so desperate. And as they say, deliverance is for the desperate. Some of you need to get desperate about your life, your health, about your family, your marriage. We're too passive. We acquiesce. We are just satisfied with status quo. But God says, no, I want you to live like me up here in the heavenly realms. I've blessed you with every blessing, but it's in this realm, and you guys start living in this realm and start walking in this realm. And so she said, I'm just going to go in, and she puts her prayer shawl over her. She's trying to go incognito. She goes into the crowd and just touches the hem of his garment, and immediately power comes out of Jesus. She's instantly healed. And Jesus said, who touched me? He's probably looking right at her because he's God. He knows everything. But the reason why he wanted to expose her publicly because he wanted to say, daughter, your faith has made you well. It takes faith. And then he wanted to say, now accept her back into society. Don't isolate her. Don't reject her. Don't have her quarantined. He cares about our relationships. He cares about every little thing about our lives. And so he said, but your faith, I want to show you a passage that it's really, uh, uh, you know, we're doing a series on Galatians right now at Harvest Rock Church. And, and, but the way the church in Galatia began was supernatural. And so the Galatian region uh, is part of Asia Minor, but the cities like Iconium and Lystra are in Galatia. So Paul's in Galatia. And just to save time, I'm just going to just share the story with you. in um, in Acts 14. And he's preaching the gospel, but he sees a man who was born lame. It says in the Bible that he was lame in his mother's womb. And he's preaching, 
And as he's preaching, it says very clearly, he saw that he had faith to be healed. Something because he was hearing the word. Again, faith comes by hearing, hearing the rhema. All of a sudden, his faith is rising. And when he sees the faith with that prophetic discernment, he says, stand up, and he's instantly healed. So here's my conclusion. Faith is a grace from God. He gives us grace, even an unbeliever, just like we were saved by grace. I wasn't, you know, a believer. I was lost. I was in drugs. But I was so, help me for God. And I was doing all the wrong things, dropping acid, going on these trips to, to find God. You know, doing this stupid uh, chant, Hindu chant, incessantly, you know. Uh, and, you know, it was, I was following Guru Maharaji Yogi Bear. You know, it was just crazy what I was into. <laughs> so I was so deceived. But God used that hunger and said, whoever calls upon me will be saved. See, the eyes of the Lord is looking throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are his. And so he said, okay, I'm going to touch you. And the spirit of God comes upon me. No one's there. No one talks to me. I am begin to weep because of the praise. I could not stop crying for three days, off and on. Faith rose. That encounter. And I believe, I knew it was Jesus from that point on. Now, it took me two weeks to give up the drugs. But then I, I did. And one day, I just was totally delivered. So here's why I'm sharing this with you. Because I want faith to rise within you as I'm speaking because we're going to pray for the sick and it's going to be my faith, but also your faith. There are times when I know, I know God's going to heal. You know why? Because God spoke to me that it's going to happen. I remember we were reaching out to our neighbors, Ann and Andy. He's, uh, he's the uh, manager for Ritz-Carlton. She's a hospice nurse. They live across the street in the previous house we lived in before we moved to our new house. And my wife is so good. She, she'll give them all the neighbors a Christmas gift. We've had them over for dinner, all these people, just reaching out, serving evangelism babysitting for their kids, just volunteering, just reaching out. And so I'm on my way to the church office. I'm walk, at the same time, Anne's coming out of her front door to visit a patient that's dying. And she sees me and she calls me over. I say, hey, Anne, what's up? It's around nine o'clock on like Tuesday morning. And she said, you know, I have a patient that's been in a coma for two months. I think today she's gonna die. And would you be willing to come over and give her her last rites? Now, she sees me as a priest. She comes from a Catholic background. And I'm thinking to myself, I have no clue how to do a last rite. I have absolutely no clue. But I figure I could fake it. I'll just share some scripture, you know, pray the, the, the disciples' prayer. And, you know, and then just serve her. Just reach out to her because I'm trying to evangelize. So I said, okay, I, I got some time before my first appointment. So I'll just follow you in my car. And so we drive up to, we're in Pasadena, drive up to Altadena, to this little bungalow. And I walk in, and there's another nurse there that she was on call. And, um, and there's this woman, 90 years old. Her name is Lois, in a coma, with all the equipment hooked up to her. And the Lord speaks to me, tell her, command her to come out of her coma and preach the gospel to her. Now, that was not on my radar. I just wanted to do some servant evangelism. I just wanted to bless my neighbor and, again, just reach out to her. But you know, the best way to reach out to any neighbor is to obey the Holy Spirit, whatever he tells you to do. So I, but I, I had to bring it gently because I didn't want her to think I, I wasn't honoring her request. So I said, Ann, do you mind if I pray a different kind of prayer? And she said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, can I pray that God would heal her? And she began to walk away from me. <laughs> she said, I knew you were a crazy fanatic. This confirms it, you know, it was that kind of look. So I go over the body, and this woman is just 90 years old, shriveled up, just on the last leg. And this is what I pray. I said, Father, I prayed what he told me to say. Father, I pray you bring this woman out of the coma so she could hear the gospel. And without any hyperbole, exaggeration, she wakes up. She just looks at me, and she sees this Korean face tearing down at her. So the first thing out of her mouth is, who are you? <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. I said, I'm a pastor. And she said, I can't believe you're a pastor. And then she goes into a soliloquy where the next five minutes she tells me her life story, nonstop talking. And this is, she said, I grew up in Kansas City. I grew up Methodist. And I knew if I died, I would go to hell. So I said, God, keep me alive until you send someone to tell me how I could get to heaven. That's her, her prayer. 
and I said to her, I said, Lois, God has answered your prayers. I'm here to pray for you, to accept you. She gives her heart to Jesus Christ, but the power demonstrated led Anne to Christ and also the Filipino nurse who was on call. Come on, that's revival. That's revival. You have that voice. It's not just for prophets. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And so God is speaking. You know, one theologian said God's constantly speaking. The problem is we're not listening. We're so distracted. We got to cultivate that heart. And I'm not here to do a prophetic course. There's others who could do that much better than me. But it's so important for us to know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's why we share testimony. The testimony is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10, when you testify, it brings encouragement. That's why, I, you know, I remember uh, there was a woman who had this disease that's incurable called reflexive sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. I mean, just to memorize that is a challenge. Reflexive <laughs> sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. What it is is it causes pain either in your feet or in your arms, and you are on opioids, the highest form of painkiller, which is very addictive. And so the reason why God used me to heal people of this because I've shared this testimony around the world. And, um, and so I was doing a healing service in Philadelphia at our HIM church there. And uh, it was just the last minute thing. And so uh, our pastor put a poster at Safeway. They have Safeway grocery stores. I don't know what you have here. But, uh, and, and just said healing service, Cheon, you know, Tuesday night was midweek uh, at seven o'clock and this woman comes in with a walker. She had it on painkillers. And, um, and so we have a healing service, um, but she doesn't get healed. So at the end I said, listen, we have time. If you didn't get prayed over, if you didn't get a healing, I'm gonna pray over you. And so we, I see her walking up to the line, prayer line, and her husband's holding her up by the elbow, you know, just supporting her behind her. Both never been in a church building in their lives first time in a church building. So, and she's wearing this, this custom-made slippers to protect her feet from the pain that she was having. So I'm walking by praying for people and then I come to her and again, the Spirit of the Lord came to me and said that she has been sexually abused and break that curse off of her. Now, how do you do that in a uh, gentle way without embarrassing anyone? So I just said, so I just asked her, whispered, and I said, have you, did you grow up in an abusive situation? And she looked at me and said, yes. I'm gonna pray that God break that curse off of you and then I'm gonna pray for you. I break that curse off of her. She and her husband both go down. I didn't even touch them. Both go down. And she had her eyes closed, but he had his eyes wide open because he's freaking out at this whole service, the whole neatly, he'd never been to anything like it. And she turns to him and said, did he just push us down? No, I had my eyes open, he didn't even touch us. And then all of a sudden she realizes she's healed. There's no more pain in her feet. But it gets really comical because now everyone's gone and they're still on the floor in the same position. They're not moving an inch. They're afraid if they move, they're going, the healing is going to go and the pain will come back. We don't know what's going on. They haven't communicated. And so the pastor being a pastor, he turns the light on and off just to give the message it's time to go. They still don't get the clue. So they're still there not moving an inch. And finally, he comes up to them and says, I'm sorry, you know, this is a rented facility and we have to close up and you have to leave. And so she gets in, she, she gingerly gets up, they walk away. I don't know what's going on. So she goes home. She thinks it's all a dream. And so she goes to sleep and uh, she wakes up the next day and she said, my painkiller is gone, it's worn out, I'll take it. So I know if I put weight on my feet and come out of bed, weight, it's gonna be excruciating. She puts weight on her feet, there's no pain. And she begins to run, she begins to dance. She wakes up the whole house, all the kids, everyone. She calls the pastor, I'm gone. I'm, I'm headed to the next city, I'm, I, I have no. And Pastor Jack calls me up and said, you, Jay, you won't believe what happened. The woman, remember the last one, she got healed of this rare disease called reflexive sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. I said, what in the heck is that? I mean, but anyway, she got healed of it. And so I'm in London preaching at a conference and I share this story. And all of a sudden someone gets up and just said, God just healed me of RSDS and it was in my hands. Look, I'm clapping my hands. They had, she had bandages wrapped around her hand. She gets healed of that. 
Then I'm in Hawaii at the Hawaiian Island Convention Center uh, conference. It's an evangelical conference. The other speakers are James and Shirley Dobson, to give you an idea. It's not a charismatic. <laughs> but the guy who organized it was a Fuller student, and I prayed for him to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He got baptized while he spoke in tongues, so he wanted me to speak there. And so, anyway, I'm there. And so I share this story, and another person get healed of RSDS. Just the testimony, no prayer. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. That's why, you know, John Arnott was so good with the Toronto blessing, he always had people testify what God did and took time to do that. It was so strategic. And we need to have more testimonies like that. So here's what I want to do. I, I want to pray two things. I want us to just really receive our inheritance, receive who we are in Christ, that we're sons of the Most High God that we have been given the kingdom as our inheritance, that we're seated with him in the heavenly places. Again, the eyes of our heart will be enlightened, that we will know the hope of our calling. This is our hope. This is what sustains us, knowing who we are in Christ Jesus. And knowing our authority. And so that's the first prayer. The second prayer I want to pray is I want to pray for those who are sick here. Now, after I pray, a corporate prayer, I'm going to give some words of knowledge out, but it's your responsibility to say, because I could be very general, but let me tell you, just have something happened in our church. Uh, she testified to Easter, so it was April. She had stage four cancer, Christina, and, uh, and it started with her bone, so we're talking about bone cancer, which is just a death sentence. And, um, and she asked for prayer. We prayed for her. And I felt like the Lord said to her, just fight it with everything you have. Chemotherapy, radiation, whatever, you know, eating properly and all that. So she did that. And she wasn't getting any better. She couldn't walk. She couldn't be at the service. So she's watching us online. And all she did was just watch YouTube messages uh, while she was in bed of people preaching on healing just to build her faith. And for whatever reason, she heard a preacher preach and about the cross. And when he said, it is finished, what Jesus said, it is finished. It hit her that Jesus took my sickness. He carried my pains and by his stripes, I'm healed. And she got instantly healed, instantly healed. What radiation, cancer treatment, all this. And this just happened. That word, that rhema that came to her that's why man doesn't live by bread alone, but every rhema that comes from the mouth of God, we need the rhema of God. So don't poo-poo and say, oh, well, who doesn't have a back problem, you know? No, say, that's for me. I claim that. That's your responsibility. My responsibility is to do my best to hear from God. Let's all stand up. Father, we are in the greatest move of your spirit now. In 50 years of walking with you, I've never seen what I'm beginning to see now. It's not just revival, it's reformation. The overturn of row is just one sign that you're on the move. We're in a historic time. Even this gathering on a Sunday night filled to capacity because people are hungry for you. And I believe that we're on the verge of the greater glory that Haggai 2, 9 says the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. And we're going from glory to glory until Jesus Christ comes back. But Father, we pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, but also who we are in Jesus. That we're all sons of God, just like we're all the bride of Christ. We're all sons of God. We've been adopted and you've given us the kingdom as our inheritance. He says, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure. It is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the Father's good pleasure for the fullness of deity to dwell in bodily form in Jesus. And when you accepted Jesus into your heart, he came in, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Being born again is not a religious thing. It's supernatural. It's a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit, with the resurrected Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and your sin. Your real man, the spirit man, was dead. But the Holy Spirit came and made it alive. And you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But we have to steward what God did. We can't just think of the cross. We gotta think of his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And we are now seated with him 
at the right hand of the Father, the place of privilege and position of authority. Far above all principalities and powers, no matter how dark it gets, we're above it. And we're to bind and lose as the Holy Spirit directs us and guides us. So I pray for this impartation, Father. We're just scratching the surface. That's why Paul says the mystery of the gospel. We don't fully get it, but we ask you to help us. Help us to understand. Help us to know you. Help us to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Give us this grace in Jesus' mighty name. Now receive it by faith. Just receive it by faith. Just now receive this revelation of sonship, of my inheritance, my authority in Christ. Now I'm going to have those who need prayer for healing. I'm talking about incurable disease, chronic pain, but even if it's something that's small but it's still bothering you, if you need prayer for that, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? You just need prayer. Now I'm going to ask people around you to be kind enough, just put their hand on your shoulder because we're going to exercise our authority by laying hands on them because now I want all those who have your hands raised to repeat after me, but make this your decree, make this your confession. Just say with me, Heavenly Father, I believe in your word. Your word says, Jesus went about doing good, healing all oppressed of the devil. So with the authority you've given to me, I rebuke the devil. I rebuke the spirit behind this pain, behind this disease. And I command you to leave in Jesus' mighty name. Now you lay hands on them because the Bible says we shall lay hands on the sick and they will, not might, they will recover. It's a done deal. Receive it right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, come now. Let your power come. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You know why Catherine Coleman was so powerful? I had the privilege of being a believer when she was ministering. I never saw her live, but I would watch her on TV all the time, mesmerized by her. She wouldn't do a thing until she heard the voice of God. I mean, she would just just delay, 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 and just say, the Holy Spirit's not here yet. And what she was talking about, the manifestation of the voice speaking to her to give the words of knowledge. And so I'm waiting. I'm not going to make up something. I'm going to do my best again to invite the Holy Spirit to speak. And he's showing me a number of things right now. I see someone with a sharp pain in their right shoulder blade. And go ahead and move it. That is lifting off of you. And that, and if I could have the house light up a little bit, because I want to see who is getting healed of that right now, even. Thank you, Lord. Who is that person right now? Your pain in your right shoulder blade just lifted right there. You felt it lift off of you. Come on, let's give Jesus praise and glory. Eyes are being healed, nearsighted, farsighted, cataract. I just saw eyes being healed. So put your hand on your eyes and just receive that. Just receive that wherever. And then I want you to test it. I want you to look at a book or do something. See, look at me, and if it's clear, just begin to thank God. There's someone with a, a throat problem, esophagus. It's hard for you to swallow and there's pain, and God's taking that pain away right now. Just go ahead and swallow. Who is that person? If the pain is just going right now, would you raise your hand? If the pain is leaving you right now? Okay, you just received. The faith is on you. Who else has just received? In the back. Thank you, my God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. Now, it's still Jesus who heals. I'm not a healer. We're just partnering with them. That's his methodology. It's called the great co-mission. Not just you do it and I'll watch or I'll do it and you watch. No, we're doing it together. That's a partnership that he wants from us. It's so beautiful. I mean, I just, God, why would you want to even use us? 
And yet he says, I made you a little bit lower than me. And I've crowned you with glory and majesty. You're made in my image and my likeness. And that's why every human being matters to God. Every unborn child, but every human being, period. And we're to love them and accept them. Doesn't mean we agree with them, but we're to love our enemies even. And that's radical, but that's Jesus. Come Holy Spirit, I see someone with some kind of uh, acid reflex problem, your digestive system, God's healing your digestive system, receive that right now. I'm not gonna ask you, some of you, some of you are gonna have to test it, but who is that person with a digestive problem? And, and just claim it right now, just claim it right now in the name of, claim it right now. Okay. Claim it, who else? Right over there, there are a number of, don't be shy, just say, this is me, I receive that. That's, again, you have to move by faith. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Who's the one with the eyes got clearer? You just tested it and you could say, I could definitely notice a noticeable difference. Who is that person? Ma'am, right here. You could say, well, come on up here. I want to just see what was wrong, near side, far side. What? I think that it went with the autoimmune, um, just the low immunity that I had. Uh, the Lord told me that I believed the lie that I was worthless all my life and that um, it was tied to the sickness in my body and he's raising up me to know who I am in Christ to raise my immune system in Jesus name. Amen. Isn't that amazing?